Welcome to today's Cove Talk. Today we're privileged to have Michael Veach join us. Michael first came to prominence in Australia as a comedian in The Degeneration, Fast Forward and Full Frontal. But he's also become a military historian and has written numerous books on that topic and other topics as well. His most recent book is called Australia's Secret Army and he's here with us this evening to talk about his research behind that book. So we're really happy to have him here today and we hope you enjoy the Cove Talk. But no, I'm not an historian, but I am a, a um, storyteller with a lifelong passion for the history and achievements of our armed forces, particularly um, in this era that I've spent a good few years um, studying and writing about our efforts in the Pacific. Because still even today, there are so many stories and so many tales of endeavour and heroism and sacrifice and cunning and luck and funny stories, brilliant stories, crazy stories, uh, some terrible stories. They weren't all angels, these people, by any means. But they're so much more devoted to what was happening far, far away than what was happening so close to our shores. In a bit of the context of what the Japanese war was like for Australia in the late 30s, 1940s. We weren't the country we are today. There, was no, there were no Chinese restaurants. There was no concept of other cultures. We were very much a British kind of little dominion on the bottom of the world, monocultural. And I, and I stress that because people knew the Germans. Everyone's dad had fought the Germans in the First World War. We understood the Germans because they came from more or less the same stock. Half of South Australia was German. When the Japanese entered the war, it was as if we were being invaded from pe by people from Mars. There was no concept of who these people were. It was like being invaded by faceless people that you couldn't, and as, as we soon found out, didn't play by the rules. You couldn't reason with the Japanese, the, with the Imperial Japanese. You couldn't, you couldn't talk them down. You couldn't have a reasonable conversation. You, 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 they, the, you, you couldn't have a reasonable expected battlefield conversation with them because they were playing and fighting by utterly different rules and it took us a long time to get our, uh, our heads around that. We started to hear the evidence of what was happening in those first few spectacular months after Pearl Harbour. There's no point in going into what the Japanese had been planning it for, well, you, you could argue a hundred years. It was a hundred year, eighty hundred year culmination of what they had been planning to do since they were forced open after six hundred years of isolation in the middle of the 19th century. And they planned very early, they decided very early that their culture was superior to every other culture in the world and they were going to assert their dominance. They were playing a very, very long game. And Australia particularly bore the brunt of it because nobody saw it coming. And when we did see it coming, when we started to hear the stories of how they were conducting their war, we didn't believe them. The Japanese atrocities, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but give you an honest idea, the, the Japanese atrocities that were committed throughout New Guinea and the Solomon Islands were so ghastly that a royal commission at the end of the war, which catalogued as best it could what they actually did, was suppressed from the Australian public for 24 years. A little bit of the background. Oh, that, that's my book, it's Australia's Secret Army. Australia's Secret Army, it's the story of the Coast Watchers. Who are the Coast Watchers? The Coast Watchers were essentially a bunch of Australian civilians who happened to be up there in this part of the world to our north when war came. What were they doing there? Well, that's kind of a, that's an interesting story because Immediately, Australia, people forget this, Australia that was 
until a few years before this collection of colonies, actually had a little mini empire itself that they picked up after World War I. Why? Because our Prime Minister Billy Hughes went to the Treaty of Versailles and demanded that all those former German colonies, the Germans had moved in there in what they call the scramble for empire in the uh, late, the mid to late 19th century. The Germans were slow off the mark because they'd only been a country since 1870, but when they did become a country, they wanted to get going quickly and they grabbed everything they could, little bits of Africa, little bits of this and that, little bits of the North Pacific, and particularly places that hadn't been claimed by anyone, the South West Pacific just to our north. They, ca they called it Kaiser Wilhelm's Land, they built um, a few little towns. They particularly built um, a, 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 a beautiful uh, town on the northern tip of a very strange banana-shaped island that they called New Pomerania, that then the British uh, renamed New Britain, and that town was Rabaul. We'll be hearing a little bit about Rabaul in this talk. Um, Billy Hughes went to Versailles determined that Australia's contribution uh, which, uh, to World War I, which on a per capita basis was phenomenal, uh, and started basically being bolshy and demanding that we have uh, a, a say in the reconstruction of the South Pacific after the Germans had been kicked out. Woodrow Wilson was appalled at this upstart, you know, vulgar Australian and said, well, who do you represent? Said, Mr. Wilson, I represent 60,000 dead Australians, was Billy Hughes's response. And they picked up all these recently vacated little bits and pieces of what had been German territory that the Germans had now relinquished. Everything south of the equator was distributed between Great Britain, Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand even picked up a few over near New Caledonia. To the north of the equator, another country very quietly and timidly, and timidly put up their hand for some territories the Germans had evacuated north of, north of the equator, and that country was Japan. Nobody even suspected then what they were up to. Japan had joined the Allied side in World War I, banking on the fact that we were going to win for this very reason. Because they had planned decades in advance, if we're going to create our empire in the Pacific, we need bases, we don't have them, we need them, the Germans have them, I'm, we're betting that they're going to lose them and we'll do the right thing to pick them up and by God it worked a treat. Billy Hughes saw it, he was one of the only people in the world that did. So what did we, we um, uh, pick up? Well, it's a strange story. Um, that's more or less the map today and this area that you know, I've been to once, the Solomon Islands. Um, uh, New Britain, that's um, what, the, what was called, the, the Germans called New Pomerania. The map back then was done. This is before World War, uh, this is about 1920. Um, how we picked up New Guinea is kind of nuts. And it was go goes just quickly because it's a funny story. The Premier of Queensland, whose name I actually uh, can't uh, forget, M Magnuson or something, was about to lose an election. Typical Queensland Premier. What did he what did he decide to do? He he he'd, he'd fly the flag of patriotism, and he said, Queensland, we need a colony. What's around? He looked at the map and said, What about over there? And he literally sent a gunboat into Port Moresby and said, this is an Australian colony uh, for the British Empire, but it's essentially Australian. He cabled, and he did it completely without telling London. Uh, London was aghast. They said, we actually don't want it. And he said, well, you've got it, and it's part of Australia now, hence part of Britain. He won the election, of course, because everybody thought it was fantastic, but of course nobody knew what to do with it. Because he presented Britain with a fait accompli, they said, all right, well, we'll kind of have it, but we don't know what to do with it. New Guinea, it's too far away, uh, it's too expensive, there's no resources, they didn't know gold was there at the time. So it became a, the Australian territory of New Guinea, and it was sort of this bit here, these are the various provinces, but this was Australian, that was um, British, it was the province of Papua and New Guinea, and they were actually separately ad 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 Administer, ad administered until Britain, and Britain had the northern bit, and they said after a while, look, we're sick of this. Australia, you can have the whole bloody lot, and you're paying for the whole thing, and please don't do it again. So that's how it became after 1919 Australian Territory, which was then populated by Australians, who 
had all sorts of interesting careers and jobs, going up, to, up there in the early 20s to do things like um, uh, run uh, copra, coconut plantations, coffee, rubber was becoming a big um, industrial cash crop commodity. They employed many, many local people. Um, uh, they introduced law, Australian law, Western white law, if you like, and there was a little mini army of what they call administrative officers who went up to um, uh, New Guinea, particularly, and did their best to administer the law. This island, uh, New Britain, it's 600 miles, what's that in K, 750 or 8 or something, from tip, that's Cape Gloucester there on, on, on that end, and up the top is that harbour, one of the most magnificent deep water ports in the world, Rabaul, which the Germans had laid out in this beautiful European um, um, uh, manner with gorgeous fully grown peppercorn trees and double lane roads and lovely houses. And the Australians moved in, said, thank you very much for all you very clever German town planners. We shall um, have a lovely time here, which they did. Australians, uh, and it was a pretty benign rule. It was a pretty cooperative rule. And I want to get to that later because there was some particular element of the Australian character that worked with a lot of the people from these islands. They clicked in a way that oh, in a way that the British didn't. The British picked up a lot of the Solomon Islands going down there. We picked up this lot here. We, we had all of this, uh, these islands here. That's the um, Bismarck Sea, named by the Germans, of, of course. Uh, but these two places, New Britain. And this one, long one here, New Ireland. And if there were ever a place where dinosaurs were still living somewhere in the world, it would be New Ireland. After World War I, so you have a population of, I think, uh, by about 1926, it was about 800 Australians living in Port Moresby, New Britain, New Ireland, on the various uh, little townships there. Bearing in mind, most of it's jungle. Most of it is tracks, tribes, indigenous tribes, uh, fertile land, yes, if you know how fertile it is and what to do with it. But a, a, a lot of them didn't. Uh, a lot of people made a lot of money up there. Um, it was an expat community. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of fortunes were made. We'll be hearing about a couple of the people who did make a fortune and then impacted when the war came a little bit later. But the Australian, but back in Canberra, <coughs> actually particularly Melbourne, which was the capital then, the Australian Navy started to get their intelligence service working. And it came out of a report that had concentrated on Australia's security situation in World War I, its home security situation. And they'd estimated that up to 70 German ships had basically been coming to Australia without even being noticed. And they only knew that because they, after the war they went into the German naval records in Kiel and worked out these German ships, somewhat like fully-fledged warships, had been basically sailing around the country and nobody had, had even known they were there. It was then estimated in a report in about 1924 that the Australian uh, coast is so porous that an army strength up to a division could be landed on anywhere on hundreds of miles, particularly of the West Australian coast, and it would be up to a month before anybody knew they were even there. This situation was, of course, intolerable and had to be uh, arrested in some way. So the Australian Naval Security um, uh, uh, Organisation was established in the 1920s under a man called Cocky Long, who, was a, um, who actually was a brilliant man, but... It was so, um, security was so badly thought of by the Australian defence establishment that they told him, you'll um, never rise above the rank of lieutenant commander if you want to take this job. And he said, well, I still want it. So he spent the rest of his career in the, in the, in the Royal Australian Navy as a lieutenant commander, and that was it. But he was brilliant because he realised what our situation was, and particularly the gateway of our predicament being the North. There was no way we could see what was coming. So they did something about it. They established an organisation called the Coast Watchers, a benign, passive organisation, enrolling civilians because they couldn't pay them and there was certainly no 
money in, in between the interwar years in Australia to establish forts or bases or defensive positions in these areas throughout North. So what they did was uh, appeal to the patriotism of these people who are living up in the islands, working, living their lives, often making a lot of money, being policemen or all sorts of, um, um, all, all sorts of things, to just keep an eye on things. If you see a ship coming into a harbour, it's flying a foreign flag. Initially, it was just write us a letter, can you believe? Then when the telegraph got going, they got a special dispensation to send free telegraph messages in open telegraph, crazily, um, to a repeater station that would eventually be, be sent down the line to uh, Melbourne and Canberra. Okay, um, German ship, uh, Fijian ship, Malay ship has just turned up into um, uh, Port Moresby. What's it doing there? Coast watchers, of course, were also spread around the northern coast of Australia, but they never had cause to do much, really. It was really in this area we're looking at on this map here, and, and of course, further down to the uh, Solomons, of course, which is not on the map, that the coast watchers really came into their, um, into their own. Um, the Great Depression hit. Money for the coast watching service started to dry up. It nearly died. Um, it, 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 it died the death of a thousand cuts until we realised in about 1938, heck, there is going to be a war. Germany will certainly be in it. Japan probably will be in it. And they're going to be looking towards our part of the world. We better do something about it. It was revived. The Coast Watchers was revived. They were running very, very late. They had no one to actually head the organisation up, head the organization up until they came across this fellow here, Eric Felt. Commander Eric Felt, what an incredible, remarkable man. Director of Naval Intelligence during World War II. He was the head of the Coast Watching Service. He had been one of these New Guinea patrol officers, um, making his way through the jungles of these islands, getting to know the people. He spoke six native languages. There are thousands of languages up there, but he spoke six of the main ones. That really impressed the people. Uh, he was... He was um, a decent man, a brave man. He'd been in the Royal Australian Navy during World War I, didn't do much, went over to Britain, basically learnt to freeze his ass off and hate the English, basically, is what he did during World War I. He came back, uh, decided to make his career up in the islands. He was then picked out. While he was on leave, coincidentally, in Brisbane at the, in the, at, uh, the first week of the Second World War in 1939, Picked out to, uh, uh, to be flown to Melbourne. We had a conversation in St Kilda Barracks with this fella, Cocky Long. He said, we have this organisation here in your part of the world, the Coast Watchers. We need it now. We have no one to set it up properly, to administer it, administer it to run it. It's all we've got. We're going to be at war up there. <coughs> up there. You know it as well as I do. We know what Japan's going to do eventually. We need someone like you to put it all together. And he said, yes, I will do it. He went back there. And in the last couple of months of uh, 1939, early into 1940, before the Pacific War, way before the Pacific War, he expanded the Coast Watch organisation by crisscrossing all these islands that he knew because he was a senior patrol officer. He knew all the white people, many of the um, tribal natives, uh, uh, um, uh, village leaders, and tribal leaders, he knew on first name terms and they greatly respected him. He said, we're going to need you over the next couple of years. This is what we need you to do. It wasn't telegraph. Um, it wasn't telegraph. It wasn't letters. Because thank goodness by this stage, the um, amalgamated wireless Australasia had invented the AWA 3B teleradio. Look at it. Isn't that wonderful? The size, weight and dimensions of a small family car and that's what they had to traipse through the jungle. But it was brilliant. This was the tool of the Coast Watchers, the AWA teleradio. It came in three parts, a, a receiver, a transmitter, and a microphone. There was also an enormous um, uh, aerial power cables. It, had, it was charged by, get this, a small benzene motor, which charged two car batteries which all had to be carried up and down over through the jungle tracks of New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Uh, it was cast iron, it weighed an absolute tonne, but it actually worked and it was brilliant. It had a range of about 400 miles um, uh, uh, over voice and I think about 600 miles with a Morse key. 
It's incredible what one person can do. What one individual in the right place at the right time in an environment with which he or she is vaguely familiar what they can do. Because this is what this aspect of the Pacific War was about. It was unlike any other war basically fought anywhere. It was felt, it, it was fought in one of the most remote parts of the globe at the absolute end extension of supply lines of both belligerents. Knowledge of this area was almost non-existent. There were no airfields that didn't have to be built. There were no train tracks. There were no highways. There were no roads. There was essentially no population. In the sense it was a kind of a pure war in that it really essentially only involved armies. That's a bit simplistic because particularly on the Japanese side, the civilian populations of, of New Guinea and the Solomons copped it badly from the Japanese. But essentially the Pacific War to our north was fought by individuals um, who'd been trained to various extents in an environment that was utterly hostile, not just to fighting, but to basically living. Um, a little passage to just describe um, what it was like. <clears throat> The Marines would patrol the alien jungle beyond the perimeter. I'm jumping ahead to Guadalcanal, but it's a paragraph that gives an idea of what it was like. Traipsing through this surreal, leech-filled world of mud and putrid undergrowths, of tangled mazes of tree roots, which a hundred times a day caught the ankles of cursing, stumbling men, of airless silences interrupted by the sudden shrieks of unseen creatures, of snakes and gargantuan spiders and crocodile-infested swamps into which a man could disappear forever with one misplaced step. And all the time, a pounding, unrelenting humidity drenched men's bodies in enervating, enervating streams of sweat. Suffering from an unquenchable thirst, they lifted their heels imploringly towards the barest whiff of breeze. That's what, for a large part, the Pacific War was like. The Coast War, particularly, of course, for the soldiers who were sort of thrust into it, you needed years, you needed decades to get used to this environment, and this small army of Coast Watchers had that experience, which is why they were able to do what they did. Well, what did they do? <clears throat> I'll break this up into just a couple... I mean, you could spend hours talking about what the Coast Watchers did. They were, they've been described as, and I'm not kidding, the most efficient spy ring in history. What they did with their numbers is incalculable in terms of um, military effect. Literally changing the course of battles with one signal because there was no, in, there was no one else there. Uh, the bravery that they showed, the ability to adapt to situations that they showed, the, the cunning that they showed, the dedication to what they were doing that they showed is extraordinary. And they were essentially civilians. They were brought into the military, they were given token commissions because when it was realised what the Japanese were doing to the people they captured, they thought that if you give them a... a, a, a civilians were simply executed on the spot if you were caught spying because you were just a civilian spy. If you're in the military and you're an officer, perhaps they thought they would give you um, a, a better treatment. Well, it soon transpired the Japanese were um, equal opportunity barbarians, so it didn't really matter. However, they were given rank, uh, junior officer rank, all the services pitched in, dropped them a couple of pips to put on their decaying shirt in the middle of the jungle and gave them token commissions and token, um, and token field ranks for the duration. It didn't really matter. They were essentially civilian spies who basically uh, um, taught themselves to live and exist and uh, work in the jungle and make it work for them, which is what they had to do. Um, uh, 37 of them, I think, are 37 or something like, or 47, around that number were captured by the Japanese. Uh, none survived the war, of course. Uh, the Japanese very quickly realised that they were out there somewhere, 
in these islands of the Solomons, somewhere in the highlands of New Guinea, because they could hear the signals of the Morse and the open voice being transmitted, but they usually couldn't find them. What they were doing? They were doing what they were taught, told to do before the war, keep an eye out for things. But of course now, their situation had pivoted from being benign civilian observers to spies operating behind enemy lines. Enemy lines. And it happened in an instant, because that 100-day advance of Japan after, World War, uh, after Pearl Harbor is unprecedented in history, literally. The territory they covered and conquered in the shorter space of time, I, don't, I think you have to go back to Genghis Khan or something, literally the military historian say, well, there's nothing like that. They swept down, they picked up Hong Kong, Malaya, they'd organised all sorts of little coups in places like Thailand and Indochina, Vietnam, to just walk in without firing a shot. All their ducks had been set up in a row and they just started to. They, even, they actually got victory disease, meaning they expanded so far so quickly, they actually started to get the jitters. Can you believe it? They reckon if they'd marched into... Uh, if they'd sailed into Port Moresby Harbour in February 1942, which they could have easily done, that would have been it. But they actually, their victories were actually exceeded what even the uh, uh, most optimistic and bullish of the Japanese admirals and generals had expected. So they kind of hedged their bets. They had this huge explosion of violence up until about... Um, well, actually, up, up until um, Darwin was bombed on the 19th of February 1942, and then they kind of slowed down a bit. And they probably shouldn't have, because they could have kept on going, but they didn't. Thank God they, they didn't. The Coast Watchers were there. They were suddenly realising that these little towns up the road that they knew so well were now occupied by the Japanese. Now, it wasn't like the Germans occupying France. You couldn't occupy these areas of the world. There weren't enough people. There's not enough place to put them. They're vast. They're uninhabitable. They're inhospitable. It's a myth that the Japanese were good jungle fighters. They hated the jungle uh, as much as anyone did. They were trained in it a bit in China. There's not much jungle in China that, that, that they fought on in their long wars there. They were... Um, what the Japanese... What, what the Japanese did well on the battlefield in, in the jungle was outflank. They were brilliant at outflanking. You hit them, they just go round and round and round and round until they got you in the end and they could live off a handful of rice a day. They were very tough and very pugnacious, but they had no plan B. If they were told to do something by an officer and the officer was killed, they didn't know what to do. They were like kind of, you know, it's like what, what's that AI film with um, iRobot, you switch off the main robot, and they, could have, they started wandering around, oh, well, I'll, I'll just stand here till I die and, and fire my gun. That's kind of basically what the Japanese war, uh, the Japanese con conducted their war, particularly as things started to, to go bad. Very good at the beginning because they had a lot of confidence, but it's a myth that they were these brilliant jungle fighters. Um, they were very fast. That's the other thing, they were fast. They knew how to move. They used bicycles and they used trucks and they, and they actually ran. There are stories of whole divisions sweeping down the Malay Peninsula, running down highways because they were very fit. That's what they were good at. The myth that they were, the fact that they were brilliantly uh, uh, suited to the jungle is a myth. Most were boys from Tokyo and um, Nagasaki and the big cities of Japan. So forget that. But we thought they were good jungle fighters, and it kind of terrified Australia, the, the, the Australian soldier, at the very beginning until we started to get the edge of them. But I'm digressing about it. I just want to paint the picture of what, what, it, was, what it was like, the various belligerents up there. Um, the first incident involving the Coast Watches is an epic saga. Uh, we've got to go quickly back to New Britain, around Rabaul, which is where... The poor buggers of a, of, um, a battalion, they called them Lark Force, they'd been basically recruited from the suburbs of Melbourne and Adelaide. They were put there uh, six months before Pearl Harbour, basically as garrison soldiers around the uh, harbour. They were led by a fellow called Scanlon, who was a World War I hero and one of the worst commanders Australia's ever put into the field. He not only did not believe... Is there a Scanlon here? No? I'm sorry, is he a relation? Is, is he a relation? Oh, thank God for that. Scanlon was... 
Scanlon was in charge of Lark Force. Not only did he not believe the Japanese was uh, any kind of worthy soldier, he refused to countenance the notion of any kind of, not even a, a retreat, but a tactical retreat. He refused to allow his soldiers to even go into the jungle to have a look, let alone learn to fight in it. He refused to allow any collaboration between the native people and the Australian soldiers there. Uh, one of the most fertile areas in the world, but I said you've got to know what to do there. He, some of the native um, policemen said, would you like me to train some of your men in how to spot taro in one of our gardens? And they said, no, 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 no. We, we, we don't go away. We don't want you to do that. And he also took away the native policemen's guns as well as an incredible insult to them. Um, Australia's relationship with the, the, the Papuans and uh, the Solomon Island has improved from this moment, but it was a very, very bad beginning. But we did learn from it. Scanlon refused to allow his men to have anything to do with the situation in which they found themselves. Unbelievably. The Japanese knew what they were doing. They attacked with a force of 5,000 um, amphibious soldiers. The battle lasted about 10 minutes. The garrison soldiers broke, ran, they didn't know what to do, they hadn't been trained, they kind of fled down these jungle tracks. They'd been there for six months, hadn't even seen them before. So you had 800 men, the ones that had survived the initial amphibious onslaught, that were never going to survive anyway. They should never have been there, they should have been pulled back by our government months earlier. But there they were, trapped on this island, jungle island of New Britain, with no one to help them. The Australian government said, well, I'm sorry, but everything, every, the, 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 the whole balloon's gone up, everything's gone to shit, we can't set, we've got no planes to send you, we've got no ships to send you, you're on your own. 800 men, 800 Australian soldiers basically told, you're expendable, nothing we can do for you. Enter the Coast Watchers. The first amazing thing that the Coast Watchers and a couple of brilliant civilians did was round these men up. Um, unfortunately, there's no photo of Keith McCarthy in his youth. This is much, much older when he became a, a, a politician after the war. Keith McCarthy was described by Eric Felt as, um, a, as a, a, a short, red-headed Irishman with the, temp with the temperament of a short, red-headed Irishman. Uh, he, was a coast he was a district commander for Talisir, which is the middle bit of the island. He was around here. Uh, he, was a, he was a patrol officer in this area here. Uh, when Japan invaded and broke the Australians in a very short space of time, scattered them, silence fell on Rabaul. On our, uh, we, we didn't know what was happening there. Felt signalled um, Mackenzie to travel 200 miles up to have a look. What's going on? We haven't heard anything from Rabaul in, in five days. We suspect the words. Can you go and have a look? He then walked up these tracks with his... Um, uh, about 20 of his native bearers and helpers. We'll get to them in a moment because no Coast Watcher could have survived a week without a dedicated team of, uh, of natives of, the, of these islands to which they were devoted. Both of them were devoted to each other. An incredibly important part of the equation. He was met the other way by these panic, staggering soldiers in full retreat, not knowing what to do, not even knowing how to survive in the jungle. We've got to get to other elements of this story. So he um, gathered them up and had this sort of Pied Piper expedition going along this coast, wondering what the hell, constantly radioing um, uh, the mainland, saying, what do we do with these people? How do we pick them up? Uh, and they said, well, we don't know what we can do. Um, Vitu Island, you can see it there. There's, there's a wonderful story where on his final radio broadcast to Port Moresby saying, can you send a kind of couple of Catalinas? These men are dying, they're ulcerated, they're incredibly uh, uh, down, I've got not enough food for them. They, um, he relied on a network of native people to feed them. It took about six or seven weeks as they were retreating away from the Japanese. The Japanese stopped, stopped following them after a while, there was no point. Um, and, and they had other things to do. There was a uh, a wonderful story on a beach somewhere, somewhere I think around this this area here, this little point, um, Elmore Bay. Yes, uh, uh, Rybert Bay. Yeah, it was that one. Right there. These 
Soldiers were on the beach, starving. Their clothes were rotting. Some of them were half naked. They were bearded, ulcerated, living off a, a couple of pieces of taro a day, a bit of rice, a bit of coconut, uh, terribly malaria-infected. And in their stupor, they watched out to sea and saw a sailboat. A sailboat coming towards them. There was a single sail, and, and they sort of watched it, and they came onto shore, and off stepped a woman, just by herself. It was a little catch. And she, wore, and she was in a beautiful pressed silk 1940s gown and a shirt and blouse and pressed pants. And she walked up the beach and her hair was done. And she was kind of kind of really striking looking woman of about sort of 40. And they, some of them apparently literally, literally thought they had died and gone to heaven. And she was an angel coming to greet them. And she said, um, who's in charge here? And they pointed to Keith McCarthy and said, I'll go and talk to him. And apparently Keith McCarthy saw this woman, he kind of like... <laughs> He was half naked and tried to cover up his bits by, you know, by sort of covering up himself with something and said, who are you? Oh, I am, my name's Gladys and I live over on Vitu. Can you see it there? She was one of these people that had come up with her husband to run a, a um, copra plantation and had made a mozza in the 1930s. The husband died, she was a widow and she was picking up on her radio receiver all the panic uh, radio traffic about these poor Australians trying to flee, heading down to, um, to trying to get away from the, the Japanese. She sailed over on her own. She was a brilliant huntsman. There's got to be a movie about th th this woman. There really does. She was a superb uh, sailor. She was a brilliant shot. She was a navigator. And she said to them, look, um, uh, uh, what can I do for you? And he said, well, we've got, we've got to get these men off. Well, I actually have a ship. <laughs> over on my island and you can have it. So they arranged a ferry back and forth, the um, uh, men of Lark Force, and eventually they found their way to Australia. That's Gladys. That's what she looked like in the 1950s, a little bit older. She survived and then died of blackwater fever, a, a terrible, because uh, she went back to her island after the Japanese had wrecked it. And that's the ship that she took them on, her ship that was carrying her, her coffee, her um, coconut plantation. And uh, that's what the remnants of Lark Force came back to Cairns Harbour on. They apparently disembarked and all the people of Cairns came out because they'd heard, oh, some soldiers are coming back and they went down to greet them down the middle main street of Cairns. But they all started clapping and stopped because they realised that they were basically skeletal ghosts shuffling, terrible, terrible what, what, what we put them through. Jack Reed... Bougainville was one of the most important uh, areas of the Coast Watchers. That's what a Coast Watcher station looked like. That's, it's a bit uh, um, kind of um, uh, forced, really. Uh, that's a posed shot, but, but that's a genuine radio. And the Coast Watchers who were sent into these little sort of bits of the jungle often had little spots guarded by one of these groups of native people. The Australians got on well with the native people because they paid them. They were told early on by the um, uh, government, if you need the labour of the native people, you pay them for it. You pay them in cash, pay them in shillings. So the supply drops to the Coast Watcher stations that they could coordinate, a Catalina, one of the nightcat Catalinas would fly over and drop a couple of sacks of things. There was always a bag of shillings that they paid in cash. They were also told under no circumstances to abuse the native people at all, have huge respect for them. And after the initial very bad uh, blood that happened over on New Britain, the Australians seemed to have developed a special relationship with the native people of New Guinea and, and uh, the Solomon Islands. And I've been over there and I asked one of the... It was actually a nephew of... Um, I'll get to him in a sec. He told me that my grandfather liked the Australians because they were straight with them. They didn't put, they didn't kind of play the white man. They didn't play the colonial overlord. And the Solomon Islanders told me that we, we don't have much time for governments, we don't have much time for bosses, but we can tell the character of a person. And the Australians showed a lot of character during the Second World War, which is why many of the native people, people basically died for them. They put their life and livelihood at such incredible risk. And when you think about it, it was the strangest relationship because they were colonial overlords, let's face it. But 
Uh, the nephew of him, Sir Jacob Charles Vuza, he was, a, he was actually from Fiji, but he came over. He had family connections <coughs> in um, um, the Solomon Islands, and he was a scout at Guadalcanal. And he would go beyond the American perimeter and suss out what the Japanese were doing. He made the mistake of, uh, as he was leaving on a patrol, he accepted a present of a US flag that one of the soldiers, and he put it in his pack. He shouldn't have accepted it, but he did, because he wanted to be polite. And he was frisked by a Japanese officer who found it. And I saw the Japanese flag. He was taken into the headquarters, tortured, wouldn't reveal anything about what he was doing. The Japanese, he could say, were getting ready for an offensive. Uh, they forgot about him. They bayoneted him. They bayoneted his throat. They bayoneted his stomach. They t literally tied him to an ant's nest for a day of biting ants. He survived everything. And as they were preparing to um, uh, move up to their start line, the Japanese, he crawled through their lines, through no man's land, almost got shot by an American on the other side and said, I've got information. The Japanese are planning an attack. He was knighted for it. Um, and uh, I met his nephew and he said, I like the Australians. I like them more than the Americans because the Australians would, uh, wouldn't put any bullshit over you. And they, they liked that. They respected it. They could say, I, I, I could look, my, 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 my uncle said I could look people in the eye and tell whether they're a good person or not. And it was such an important thing that that one-on-one -on -one integrity was invaluable in all these areas. Because as I said, the Australians were in the wrong, they were not native to these areas. They were fighting a war that didn't really involve the native people. It was like two bosses fighting over you and you didn't have much power in it. When the Japanese started to suspect that many of the Solomon Islands and New Guineas, New Guineans were helping many of the Australians and the Coast Watchers, they turned on them. That's when things got nasty. And yes, a lot of them went over the Japanese side. They didn't have any choice. They had to. Because the Japanese had showed that they were completely barbaric and would not tolerate any dissent. They would call, they would call chieftains out in front of their tribe and behead them, thinking that that was going to work. It, it terrified them, but you know, it actually made um, uh, the Allied cause far, far stronger. Just one quick story of what one person can do in a jungle. I just want to... Look, look, Lieutenant Commander Paul Mason, the unlikeliest looking... Look at him. The unlikeliest looking war hero you could ever picture. He was short. He was bespectable. bespectacle. I'm glad he's not smiling because smiling, he had terrible buck crooked teeth. Paul Mason was a coast watcher. He'd be, he was a patrol officer. He'd been brought up in the um, uh, mid-30s. He was on a high ridge in the middle of Bougainville. So he was, uh, he was above Bowen. He was just above Bowen on, and his station was to observe the Japanese, what they were doing around um, the island of uh, Bougainville. He knew what was happening down here on Guadalcanal because he'd been told that the Americans are planning something. One morning, at his, on his eerie, <laughs> high on one of the mountain ridges, where he was uh, in a protected position, miles from anywhere, <coughs> he woke to the sound of aircraft engines about 8 o'clock in the morning. More aircraft engines than he ever heard. He went out and looked up and saw, uh, I think, 36 Japanese VAL dive bombers in a perfect formation heading that way along that red line. He fired up his radio and signalled to the, an, uh, an Australian receiver station around here somewhere. Uh, one of the most famous signals of the Second World War, 26 bombers heading yours. And that's all he had to say, giving his position. He knew he was talking. What it told the American Marines, who had never been in battle before, the, the big red one, the American 1st Division, who were about to go to ashore at Guadalcanal, it told them that the Japanese were onto them and they were sending aircraft uh, down from, um, uh, well, actually from Rabaul, that's where they'd taken off from, and they were heading right down along that line and they were going to surprise the American fleet as it was disembarking along the shores of what's basically now Honiara now.
and that was the beginning of the great battle of Guadalcanal. It gave the Americans um, an hour and a half, because uh, that was the flying time, it gave them an hour and a half to immediately pull up their landing craft, uh, get the men who are on the shore, uh, travelling ashore, get them onto shore, the rest they pulled back, they scrambled the wildcat fighters of the USS Wasp, it was just over the horizon, it brought them down, refueled, rearmed, they went up on a standing patrol, when the Japanese arrived they clobbered them. They tore into them, they shot down about eight of them and, and severely damaged uh, a lot of the others. And a, a wounded Japanese plane was basically a dead Japanese plane. The Japanese had no armour piercing, um, had no armour, they had no um, self-sealing fuel tanks or anything. So hours later, um, Paul Mason saw the remnants of that air fleet travelling back home, all scattered now with petrol trailing and smoke, and only a few of them made it. That was the first day of the Battle of Guadalcanal. Um, Admiral Halsey, the Pacific commander, quoted after the war, he said, Guadalcanal saved the Pacific, and the Coast Watchers saved Guadalcanal. He actually said that. The Coast Watchers gave, got so much more recognition from the Americans than they ever did from our government, sadly. There's a wonderful story of Mason and his mate Jack Reed, who I haven't had time to get to. He was at the other end of um, uh, Bougainville. When, they, uh, when the, Japanese, with the Japanese had pulled back and they were being withdrawn, their aircraft was diverted via Numea, and they didn't know why, and the, the, the pilot of the DC, he said, oh, I've got to land here. I've been ordered. I can't take you to um, Moresby. We've got to go to Numea for some reason. So the aircraft was diverted to Numea and Mason and Reed got out and they were shuffled into the office of the big American <laughs> commander there waiting in the ante room. And what, what, what have we done? I don't know. What have you done? I didn't know anything. They didn't know what, what they thought they'd done something wrong. Admiral Halsey comes out, Reed and Mason stand up, and Halsey says, Gentlemen, when I'm, when, when I'm in a room with you, Coast Watchers, I'm the one that stands, not you. And he thanked them profusely for their services during the Second World War. Um, we all know the story, just, I know we're out of time, but of course, the most famous Coast Watcher story of all is the story of a bloke who was on a volcanic island as a Coast Watcher. He was an accountant from Sydney, would you believe? He was about my age. He was an old bugger. And he saw in the middle of the night a big explosion about 12 miles off into the sea. And he couldn't work out what was happening. But he got up the next morning and looked at his binoculars and said, oh, something's happened. There's bits of ships floating all over the place. And he sent and he signalled... Um, uh, his uh, officer is saying, oh, I think there's been a naval battle and uh, I don't know what's happened overnight, but something's gone on. So he sent his people out to keep a lookout for things and after uh, a week, one of his um, native scouts stumbled across a bunch of bedraggled Americans uh, running out of water, running out of food and it was, of course, a young Lieutenant John Fitzgerald Kennedy who became the President of the United States, who was rescued by a Coast Watcher. And there's a wonderful picture of him um, uh, being greeted in the, in the White House. Uh, Reg Evans being greeted by John F. Kennedy 20 years later. He'd forgotten who he was, and he had to be reminded uh, that, oh, you, this guy in Sydney rescued you, and he flew him over. It's a lovely story. Um, I'm going to end just with the Pacific. Cape Gloucester. Read about the Battle of Cape Gloucester as an idea of what this area was like to fight in. I've read quite a bit about this battle. It's not a big battle that uh, gets much of the glory. Um, it was kind of a, it wasn't a sideshow, it was important. That eastern tip of New, of New Britain had some Japanese airfields that in the end of 43, early 44, there was a threat that they were going to use them again, so they sent the Americans in. It was the most horrible place to fight in you can possibly imagine. Uh, it lasted about two months. Not huge casualties, but no American Marine who went into the Battle of Cape Gloucester ever really came out of it. Look at those faces. Look at those blokes. Have you ever seen the thousand-yard stare of men who have been in, in a jungle fighting? Especially those blokes on the left of that um, of that uh, truck there. That's another one of some blokes who just caught a Japanese flag, like what uh, Jake showed me in your um, mess here. 
and they've just come out of the most hellish conditions. That thing, that's a new looking factory Sherman tank, just come off the factory line at Detroit and it's sent into that. And that's what they had to fight through. Wet, leeches, mud, tropical stillness, because there was no breeze, there was no air. But they slogged through it. Look at that Sherman tank having to go through that ditch and crash through virgin jungle. And that was what it was like that they had to fight and sleep and eat in it. The bravery of these men and the resilience of these men are, are, are remarkable. But the story of Australia's Coast Watch is, is unique. Um, and the Americans recognised it in a way that the Australians didn't. But that's often the way... But the way they did it was to understand where they were, not try and bring their interpretation of what it should be like to where they were, but to actually accept what it was like where they were, tear up the rule book and start again. Okay, this is what I've been taught. It's not what I expected. I'm going to have to start again. I'm going to have to learn, use what I know, use my common sense, my training, my sense of individualism as an Australian officer, an Australian fighting man, an Australian civilian, to learn from the beginning and not to take anything for granted and not to think that I'm better than any of these people who live here. And that's how they succeeded. And that's why the Jacob Vuses just, uh, put their life on the line for the Australians in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea and many, many more besides. Um, after the war, the Coast Watchers basically slinked back to their civilian lives. Paul Mason went back to his plantation. Uh, Jack Reed did the same. There's one little memorial for them somewhere up in New Guinea. It's a little white something or other, a little white tower that nobody really much goes to. But their story is quite a remarkable one. And uh, it was such a play. As Jake said, I'd written 11 books. Uh, nothing um, comes close to the what I felt was the bravery of these people, and there was certainly no story that I've written about where what I knew at the beginning was... Uh, I knew nothing of the beginning, and I had to learn all the way through. I knew no background knowledge of it all. You know just a tiny bit of it out now. Thanks so much for listening. It's been a great pleasure to speak with you uh, this evening about the Coast Watchers, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Um, look, uh, your observation that you, you, you touched on it a couple of times, but I think it's a great observation to make for everyone in this audience, but also across the broader army who might, who might perhaps uh, listen to the Cove presentation. You, you had a, a quote midway through your presentation where they knew these villages and towns, and you finished with um, they knew where they were. I think that's just such a really important observation for us all to remember when we go to any country in the Southwest Pacific, any community in the Southwest Pacific, to take the time to tune in. When we in the army do our basic training, we learn about tune into the jungle. Right, and, right. And, and let the jungle settle in around you. <laughs> yeah. but, but as you pointed out, it's tune into the people and tune into the culture was one of the things that the, the Coast Watchers did yes. so well. Yes. Um, you pointed towards that Australian culture that helped helped them, that Australian character that helped yeah. them. Do you have any other observations on, on what helped them tune in? Humour. Humour. Um, uh, the Brits couldn't do it. It was a strange makeup, the Solomon Islands. Um, uh, uh, as you know, the kind of geographical... Bougainville, I think, is actually geographically part of the Solomons, but it's actually politically part of New Guinea, which has always been weird. Um, the Brits warriors were much, and so it was a, a, a British slash Australian colony. The Brits didn't really have the, the, the population to populate the Solomon Islands after World War One. So Australians came in because we were essentially the same people. But there was a great difference, and um, the Australian sense of humour worked very well in that situation, and just an openness and just an honesty, and. It kind of worked, and, 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 and another thing I wanted to, I wasn't sure I was going to say it, but uh, I mean, we're, we're, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a humble reserve officer in the RAAF, and most of what you need, you already have. 
the ADF chooses people very wisely. It chooses people who have levels of integrity and levels of honesty. And they choose them for a reason. Because it's in situations like this, and you're the people who do shit. I just write about it and I'm in awe of what you do. But I do happen in my reading to know that when you're dealing in the situations that you come across with different cultures and different, uh, um, different environments, trying to put something over someone never works because people can see it. And the Australians were good at that. And you guys have been chosen because you have that common sense. And use it. Use it. You, I'm, I'm sure you know that gut feeling of like, is this right? In this situation, is this right to talk to this person in this way? You kind of know what's wrong and know what's right. And that's a really powerful thing. The Brits never had it. They could never, back, back in the day, the Brits that fell on their ass. They used to joke about the English because they could never kind of, you know, and they're still a bit like that too in, in many ways. But the Australians had that edge and it really worked for them. And you'll have that edge too. And I'm sure you, you already do. That's all I'll say about it. <laughs> um, hey, firstly, thank you very much for the um, brilliant brief, Michael. It's really insightful and, uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, might be a little bit more of a controversial question, but and I do note that they were commissioned officers. Do you think that commissioned officers army officers or naval officers being put into the Coast Watch, Watch's position would have done um, or been as successful as civilians doing such a job? Uh, well, bearing in mind, though, that most of them were basically just given token rank. Later in the war... Well, it, 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 it's a hard question to answer that because later in the war, uh, they insisted on all Coast Watchers have to be trained officers of each of the services, of the three services. But it didn't really matter then because the war had, 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 um, had turned it w and the, the, the Japanese were being pushed up north away from this area anyway. Um, we'll never know. We'll never know if that would have worked. What would have been like if actual trained officers... But Australia wasn't training their officers properly for this war anyway. As we saw, the trained officers were the people who were running Lark Force at New Britain. They were hopeless. They, they, they did everything wrong. They tried to be more British than the British. Uh, that fellow Scanlon hated being there. He hated the native people. He, hated, he thought he was in a backwater. He didn't even think war was going to come because they, they believed all the myths that the Japanese were hopeless and their aeroplanes were made of bamboo. They literally thought the Zero fighter was made of bamboo. I'm, I'm not kidding and that they couldn't fight. So he believed that, and that infected all his men. And when Crunch came to it, they paid for that in blood. They really did. It was the civilians that had actually been there and just experiencing the place that just sort of gleaned it. They just kind of got it, because they knew that it was a very inhospitable place, and you couldn't survive out there on, on your own. So they started to make relationships, and that's what got them through. They fed them. The native people fed them. They were scouts for them. They carried that frigging radio that weighed a ton up and down ravines, even the battery. Han, hardly any of those radios were lost. Can you believe it? They broke them down. The, um, Paul Mason would drill his um, native people into breaking down the radio because it all screws and like it was all hand bolts and <laughs> it was all enamel and they had to put it in sacks and dead, head off into the jungle. And they hardly lost one. There are about 100 of them were dispersed through the um, Coast Watcher system and some were still working up until the 60s with just new valves. It's incredible. Uh, Michael, th thanks for a, a great brief. Um, that was really insightful. I think everyone is a bit like, what do I ask? But I'm going <laughs> to do this for Richard. Um, on a serious note, what, what's the l legacy now for the Coast Watchers in terms of their, their family, the businesses, the trade and commerce? after the war, up until now, are you familiar? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing, really. I mean, uh, they were... <laughs> they were... I'm... They were given the... Um, 
Were they given the Pacific? Yeah, they were given the Pacific, st the Pacific Star. They were given the, the Australia Service Medal and the Defence Medal. Uh, very few were decorated. They got service medals. They all deserve the bloody George Cross or the or the you know the DSO or something like that. But they didn't. As I said, the Americans knew that they were good, but the Australians treated a lot of the Pacific people particularly particularly poorly. In the Air Force, it was terrible, terrible. If you um, uh, you know that they were very mean to their own people. Um, it was so much easier for an Australian airman to get decorated by the Royal Air Force in England than it was for an Australian pilot to get a medal here because the Brits gave it to them over there, but we didn't give our people anything. They went back to their civilian lives and basically didn't talk about it for decades, if ever. Um, there's only been a couple of books. Paul, um, Eric Felt himself wrote The Coast Watchers. Uh, his... He's, one, he's a wonderful writer too, and it's a really good book. It's a huge book. Uh, um, another book called The Coast Watchers was written by a guy called Patrick Lindsay in about 2001, and I've wrote the third one. And that's the only, they're the only two published books on it. But in terms of um, feats of arms, feats of daring, feats of cunning, but there's something very Australian about this story, kind of, you know, they were kind of sneaky and... They were kind of fun and they were kind of, you know, they had rat cunning, which is what I liked about it. And they did that thing just embedding themselves with the sensibilities of the people around them. Learning, oh, how do these guys get through the jungle? Well, do what they do. What do they eat? Oh, I'll eat, I'll eat that too. How do they treat people? I'll treat people the way they treat people. Just got a couple of questions, but first a personal thanks. For a year as I was growing up, I was raised by my uncle, who went through the final stages of the Bougainville campaign in 45. Never spoke about it whatsoever. As I was growing up, I learnt this story third hand, because I had to. Because I wanted to know why this man was the gentleman he was, and the hell he'd gone through. And obviously for him, the Coast Watchers were heroes. So thank you for telling this story, because for me and my family, it was something of our family. One of the things I wanted to ask you was, why do you think as Australians this story didn't resonate with us? That was my first question. I grew up with this. Why do you resonate with our nation? No, no. Because I grew up with this, because I knew my uncle was a hero. I just didn't know why. Yeah. So I read these stories as a child. It was there to be read if you bothered to read the histories. Yeah. But none of my friends knew, and obviously none of your friends or your circle seemed to know this story. And the second question was, the obvious thing for a military person, what one big mistake did the Coast Watchers make on average that you think we should not do? <laughs> they were great, but everyone makes a mistake. Trusting their leaders. <laughs> no, that's being very glib. That's been very good. In a couple of I I instances, uh, that was true. But um, to the first question, why? Well, you ask if you, why is the Battle of Milne Bay, the first defeat of Japan on land anywhere in the Second World War, a feat carried out exclusively by Australians? A couple of Americans happened to be there, and they joined along for the party. Why do we not talk about that? I've often said, if we were Americans, and thank God we're not, but if we were Americans, it would be on the stamps, these, these battles. Um, I don't know. I, we, we could spend <laughs> hours unpicking, unpicking the Australian psyche, the Australian character, the kind of the tall poppy thing, which has always got us into more trouble than not, I think. Um, my first book was on the 44 days, the, a squadron of Kitty Hawk pilots who, before the Kokoda battle got going, were one squadron of boys fending off the Japanese bombers coming over to attack Port Moresby at will. They were fighting, they flew over with an undefended city for about two months. They were bombing the shit out of it. Um, thank God they were sh very, very bad bomb aimers, the Japanese, notoriously bad bomb aimers, otherwise it would have been a lot worse. But these fellows, for 44 days, six weeks, 
they kind of it was a David and Goliath struggle, and they well, they didn't win the battle. They certainly held them up. Why isn't that celebrated? I don't know. I don't know. We're a funny lot. We're a, a funny lot. But I think we're changing. I think we're 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 changing. I don't want to go too far like the Americans do, but somewhere in in the middle is fine. What mistakes did they make? Um, look, given given um, what they were up against, um, I think they often judged some of the natives that went, look, well, there are a couple of Coast Watchers that almost went a bit rogue. I didn't have time to go into that. They kind of, um, there was one bloke over on New Georgia, who he was actually a Kiwi, Australian Kiwi, slash Kiwi, uh, and he kind of created a private army and he went a bit troppo and he started going very, very um, strange, even kind of punishing people that were fighting for him for not obeying his every word. So there are, and there's a chapter in, in, in the book about that one as well. But the only mistakes they made were being too harsh on the people because... Uh, they, they didn't understand how, and a lot of the villagers came to them and said, look, I can't, I'll, I'll never betray you, but I can't be here anymore. I've got to go down and my family is under a Japanese, uh, they're occupying my village. And if I'm not there, they'll know I'm here. I've got to go back down there. And they were very cross, well, don't, don't ever come back here and, you know, you know damned, damn you traitor sort of thing. That was a bit mean. Um... But it was not, I don't think they made any deep, drastic mistakes. Um, they, uh, the, and it wasn't just civilian stuff that they did. I mean, remember, the, I, mean, well, I haven't talked enough, the, the, enough of what the Coast Watchers actually did. They rescued down pilots. Uh, they went out expeditions to find an American and uh, Australian pilots that had fallen in the jungle somewhere, in the middle of nowhere. They went and found them and brought them back to safety. They evacuated nuns. I've got a chapter in the book about uh, a group of um, uh, Catholic American nuns who were in a mission station and believed Pollyanna-like that, oh, well, the Japanese are here. And there was one sister who wrote to her, her actual sister in Sydney saying, oh, it'll be good because we raise Japanese bicycles and now it'll be easier to get spare tyres for our Japanese bicycles from the Japanese. So crazy, they didn't understand. And they eventually had to be evacuated. So there was a amazing, that's what that submarine was, we didn't have time to get to it. They evacuated, carrying basically these middle-aged ladies, again, native bearers, made um, out of bamboo and vines, made chairs for them, carried them about 80 miles up and down, and the Americans evacuated them off. Eventually, all the Coast Watchers had to be evacuated, particularly on Bougainville, because the Japanese said, right. Because the Japanese were being stuffed around by the Coast Watchers. They really were. They, um, uh, they couldn't do anything in secret. They, were, they thought, we're in the middle of nowhere. How can anybody know what we're doing? How can they know the ships that have arrived? Why is it that two hours after a new destroyer arrives uh, in a secret little cove... There's a friggin' American dive bomber, a dauntless dive bomber, trying to bomb it. How did they know? And they realized it must be these wretched coast watchers. We're going to damn well find them. And we're going to be ruthless with any natives that we suspect even knows where they are, let alone helping them. So the Australians did not like that, and they were perhaps a bit harsh on that. But you can understand it. God knows what it would have been like there. I, I can't really imagine it, and I've sort of lived it writing the book, what it must be like. But I can't really... Imagine the horror of it, or the stress. 